the other one. David Frost here, and I've got with me three men who are going to contribute to the cascade of comedy we call Pull the Other One. They are Mr. Frank Carson, Mr. Bernie Clifton, and Mr. Ken Dodd. <laughs> now then, our many other contributors are the people throughout the world who've been involved in bizarre events. For instance, Les Doonan. Now, Les Doonan came from County Cork, and he stole a car when an attempted bank raid went wrong. He stole a car. Now, this particular misguided felon, whose imitation pistol had failed to scare the bank clerk, that's why he was in trouble. See, he wasn't very efficient. Anyway, he fled down the street, pursued by two security guards and a number of angry citizens. Spotting a car with an open window, and the key in the ignition, he leapt in and drove off as fast as he could. Which wasn't actually very fast, as he'd failed to notice that the caravan parked behind his getaway <laughs> was still, in fact, attached to it. <laughs> so there was this low-speed car chase. Doonan was rapidly arrested, and severe trauma set in for the couple who'd been enjoying some conjugal rights in their caravan. <laughs> Sad but true, um, as are all the incidents we'll be asking our great brains here to explain. This obvious story here was to get people to listen to the programme because it's sheer smut. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't see how you make that up, because I think caravan holidays are very fresh and, and it's all bunk. And uh, <laughs> the only trouble is, they, they make the sinks too high. <laughs> <laughs> Can I also uh, add, Mr Frost, the reason that Mr Carson knows that that story was all smut because he was in the caravan. <laughs> yes, but the it wasn't was smut because he was trying to light a fire at the time. <laughs> <laughs> there was no Mind chimney. It, it, wasn't yeah. a, it wasn't a main holiday, it was just a trailer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But well, he didn't know he had his wife in tow. <laughs> Very good. And so let's come on to the first tall tale. Mr Ronald Matthews, it concerns. Mr Ronald Matthews, retired electrician of Weybridge who planned an elaborate celebration for his silver wedding anniversary, including putting on fancy dress to deliver his own greetings telegram. Putting on fancy dress. That's nice. Mm. Now, where do you think that Mr. Ronald Matthews of Weybridge <laughs> went wrong? Could you, could, could, you, could you ask me first, Mr. Frost, that I think I've got a good answer. <laughs> I don't know what you all feel, ladies and gentlemen, but I think that Frank Carson's probably got something to say. Yes, I have. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think? Was right. he in the caravan with you, Frank? Yeah. Well, <laughs> actually, in fact, <coughs> I've just celebrated my 37th wedding university. <laughs> uh, wedding uh, university? University. Yes. Uh, wedding anniversary. So, uh, I always remember a fellow said to me... Uh, what is your 37? Is it enamel or wood or...? No, it's actually, Frank, it's uh, ice fault. <laughs> <laughs> Remember. You've been on the road all those years, have you? Yeah. <laughs> I said, That's what his wife says to him, tarmac. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's what my wife always said. That's why I said ice felt. Just, I always like my ice felt. Um, <laughs> Now, this Bernie, man what actually, do you think about he this? went back to his anniversary oh, no. and he dressed up as Mickey Mouse. Unfortunately, he'd put, forgotten to put the little red trousers on, <laughs> and three people in the road, three women in the road, instantly recognised him. <laughs> <laughs> or did he dress up as the second-class letter and unfortunately arrived three days too late? I think, I think something to do with, uh, with Weybridge, which is a very exclusive area. I, I, I've, been to, I've been to Weybridge really? and uh, I had a party in this wonderful house. It was so posh they'd got concealed lightings. Somebody had wallpapered over the switch. <laughs> <laughs> this man made an illuminated happy anniversary sign and he hid it under his coat. Unfortunately, on his way back home to surprise his wife, his coat blew open and he was arrested for flashing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, well. 
25 <laughs> years, that, that would mean it, 25 years, it'd be on his fourth mirror then, wouldn't it? Oh, dear. No, I think, uh, actually, this fancy dress fetish is actually alarming. It is actually catching on. I went to a fancy dress uh, ball uh, recently, and the girl in front of me, she came dressed as a flower bed. Oh, she had, ro oh, she had roses oh, and labelias. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll turn my head away. And Go ahead. <laughs> and nasturtiums, and she had a big rose just here, in a, right in a booze one. And she was dancing with the Lord Mayor of Weybridge. Oh. And he looked at this rose and he said, If I kiss that rose, will you blush? And she said, If I pull your chain, will you flush? <laughs> <laughs> well, it can, be, it can be a lot of fun going to parties and dances dressing oh. up. And I remember this uh, particular uh, young couple, they dressed up, they went to a fancy dress party and they went as a bull, a cow rather. They went to yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what did they go as? What did they went as a cow, dressed up in a cow skin. Okay. And uh, at the end of the party, um, <laughs> they, they were on their way home. So he said, well, let's take the shortcut across the field. You'll never get away with it. <laughs> of course you will. Come across on. the field. And uh, halfway across the field, when all of a sudden they heard this sort of drumming sound and uh, <laughs> the lady at the back it was Frank Carson in his caravan the lady at the the lady at the back of the cow she said what is it dear he said and her husband says well you look around he said well I hate to tell you but it's the bull <laughs> has spotted us she said well what should we do he said well I'm going to nibble grass you better brace yourself <laughs> quite solved the problem. Uh, obviously, the fancy dress was very important to the I panel. Wedding. Did he wrap himself up in bake -o foil? <laughs> and when his wife entered the door, she said, bootiful. <laughs> uh, not quite. I think Ken was very close when he mentioned, but because we have here a clue, I think, gentlemen, if you will do in the, in the question, which is a retired electrician. electrician I think right. he probably wired himself up with bulbs, as, as Ken yes, said. Indeed. Perhaps he blew a fuse. He probably, he probably okay. finished up in jail for assaulting batteries. <laughs> He was, he was putting a dry cell. A dry cell? Yeah. <laughs> and his wife, when he went to bed that night, his wife refused him. <laughs> but he escaped. Yeah. yeah. He escaped. Yeah. He escaped. He managed to vault over the wall. <laughs> Gentlemen, I think you've never been more creative, or indeed more wrong. Um, <laughs> the, uh, Mr. Matthews' mistake was simply to dress up as a postman to deliver the telegram. And the dog bit him. <laughs> exactly. Oh, well, that's uh, Postman, they do a wonderful job. And it's, it's a fa thankless till it's better than walking the streets. Right. And it is, uh... Now is the time that we must switch from the first of the tall tales to on the spot. This is a little variation, folks, where from time to time we have to put the team on the spot. Here's a nightmare. How do you get out of this? You're away on holiday, right? You meet a couple, and you find yourselves thrown together quite a lot. On the last evening, under the influence of local Beano, they actually manage to get you to swap addresses. And you, in a weak moment, invited them to drop in any time, knowing they never would. Now, six months later, it's happened. This couple, with whom you've realized now that you had absolutely nothing in common, except the local vino. They've arrived on your doorstep with four children. How do you cope? There is one. I would think we'd ask Ken first, because he, uh, he is an amateur psychologist. When we done uh, Queen's University, you'll remember, <laughs> we, we, we both studied there. The annual reunion. Years, yes. Reunion. Um, yeah, go on, Ken. Go well, on, Ken. I, I meet, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a fairly... Uh, easy-going fellow <laughs> and I meet a lot of people when I when you. I'm on holiday and I met this uh, couple last year yeah. he was sitting on the beach you know yeah. uh, wiggling well, his toes was, yeah. with the, uh, the hang handkerchief on his not yes. the knotted handkerchief and yes. she, she was fairly pleasant was this a, a and country or abroad well it was abroad we exchange addresses yeah. and uh, I'm thinking change. of taking them upon it the, the thing but where is Windsor Castle uh, is it <laughs> 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 no I I think you, you give a lot of thought to that. I think what to do, people shouldn't uh, just dump themselves on your doorstep with four children, do up, two down. I would put on one of Frank Carson's videos, and that would put him to sleep in no time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, that's funny enough. I was going to say, <laughs> if they came to my door, I'd say, oh, boy, it's time for you to watch one of my videos. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know, or the 10 years holidays I've been on, and I want you to watch all of that. I or think you could, uh, you could go next door and borrow next door's Irish wolfhound. 
yeah. and uh, take it upstairs and put shaving foam around its mouth <laughs> and chase it through the living room shouting, Mad Dog. <laughs> yeah. If it was holding one of Frank's videos in its yeah. mouth at the time, that would definitely... What would definitely you do if I landed on your front, your front door and I said, I'm coming to stay with you? Probably but... wouldn't hear you, because as we saw you coming up the path, we'd all be getting out the back door as quick as we could. I think Mr. Fr <laughs> <laughs> I think these, when these people come, you should make a fuss of them, serve them, you know, half and half coffee, half in the cup and half in the saucer, <laughs> and uh, bring the donuts in and say, the dough's for me and the nuts for you. <laughs> I think the dog is a great deterrent, though. We bought a black and white dog because we thought no. the license was cheaper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, that's huge of a young audience for that joke. <laughs> the, uh, the one of the things I'm just going to tell Mr. Frost, I've just come back from Dubai. There's a very beautiful song, as you know, written in Dubai from White Horse Inn. And I saw an Arab window cleaner there, it was called Shake Me Show Me. <laughs> and he had all these stitches around his wrist. I said, I see you have one year appeal. <clears throat> Frank Carson once tried to uh, organize one of those 1830 holidays, you know, but he couldn't find anybody born in 1830. <laughs> well, I think you're obviously all going to be lumbered with this couple, with the, with yeah. the four children, for the whole weekend. Oh, you God. haven't thought your way out of it. No, we haven't. No, no, the typical yet. situation... Could you, uh, could you take one of the kids upstairs and, and, put, and uh, with a felt tip pen, put red dots on their hands and on the face and so walk that's, down that's with That's a good child. idea. Determine. You could say, look, there's good news and there's bad news. Yeah. Uh, you've just missed the man being carried out on the stretcher. <laughs> that's the good news. <laughs> the bad news is he's the man from rent kill <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and well, straps at the same time. Well, that brings you back to the old gag. He said, I've got good news and bad news. And the good news is you have 24 hours to live. Said, but what's the bad news? He said, I should have told you yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> right. In that case, we'll see if you can help a lad in Andover, a worried lad in Andover. This is where we ask them to be agony aunts, really, basically, here, the folks. That's a good place for bank robbers, that, isn't it? I am only 17, says the worried lad. But I look even younger. Consequently, girls think I'm not old enough for them. When I ask them out, they laugh. Would it help if I made myself look older? And how do I set about this if that's the right thing to do? Bernie, is it the right thing to well, do? Well, I've got some very good advice. I once saw... Uh, there's a good way to get around this and, and to r increase your age. I once saw Ken Dodd in concert at the Crucible in Sheffield. And uh, it put years on you. Didn't well, it right? did. And <laughs> no, yeah. we were literally much older people. He's the only man I know that has two intervals in his show, so people can conference. shave. It's a two day <laughs> <conference>. <laughs> but, but you I, know, could, could you just read just read the gist? Yes, uh, the gist again. of yes, that letter I didn't again. Get all of that, uh, Mr. Frost. He's only right. seventeen. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, I see. He looks even younger, and yeah. therefore girls don't take him seriously. I Should he I'd make himself look older, or what? I wish I'd never written the letter in the first place. I tell you. This young lady has just stopped me in Piccadilly outside before, and she said, Hello, handsome. <clears throat> Can you tell me the way to the opticians? <laughs> uh, so, so many people... <laughs> So many people are worried. It's vanity. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. What, you have, what this man has to remember, this 70-year-old boy, is that, that his face and Bernie Clifton's face come from the same mould. Yeah. Except that Bernie's, Bernie Clifton's is mouldier. <laughs> He's, oh. You, Frank, I mean, you, 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 you're not bothered about your looks anymore, are you? No, not really, you, but he's what do you mean the, anymore? anymore. <laughs> You've reached the cereal age now, haven't you? The cereal, I mean, you worry more about your corns than you do about your oats. <laughs> Well, flake me if I like that. <laughs> I mean, this, this man, he could actually, this young man, he could actually grow a moustache and smoke a pipe, and that would put years on him. Well, it worked for my wife, anyway. <laughs> well, I think, I think the obvious answer to this young fella is stop wearing short trousers. Because <laughs> if he's wearing short trousers, especially if he's got hairy, on, on hairy legs. I remember as a young boy, I used to rub onions around certain parts of my body to go... <laughs> <laughs> now, why is that lady laughing? Have you done that? You've <laughs> 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 some second-hand onions up here. <laughs> were, they, were they spring onions? They <laughs> 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 were Spanish onions. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good job they weren't leeks, that's all I can say. <laughs>
The teenagers are very insecure. I've got two boys at home, 14 and 18. Well, if I was Funny a... names. Yeah, well, <laughs> if, I, if you were my father and I was 14, I'd be insecure as well. <laughs> no, and uh, one of them said to me the other day, he said, uh, Daddy said, I'm going courting, can I borrow your torch? And I said, I never had a torch when I went courting. He said, no, look what happened. <laughs> Anybody ought to worry about you looking youthful. It's never been a handicap to me, and uh, <laughs> I, 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 well, I think well, I would tell him, don't worry about how youthful you look, because when you're 70, you'll say, God, I wish I was 17 and looked younger. Wait till he gets to our age, when he, he realizes that he's still got a little black book, but all the phone numbers in it belong to doctors. <laughs> So you'd say, basically, folks, overall, you're saying, don't worry too much about this. It's all going to come right in the end. We wish we were 17 again. Yes. I yes, wish you could remember being 17. <laughs> I'll tell you what, even now at my age, I wish I could remember television before there was snooker. <laughs> 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 Somebody said to me this week, he said, you passed it. I don't even remember being alongside it. <laughs> so take, take courage, Mr. Young Man of Andover Hans. It's all going to come right in the end. Like Mrs. That. Parker of Yorkshire sent us this problem. My mother-in-law, who lives with us, is not the traditional music hall monster. In fact, she's a sweet old lady and we love her dearly. <coughs> There's just one problem. She started knitting socks for soldiers during the last war <laughs> and doesn't seem to realize that times have changed. She churns out four thick woolly pairs every week and expects me to see that they get to the troops. All the army units I've tried have politely refused. What should I do now? You should send them to some Russian nudist camp as willy warmers. I think she'd be, this, <clears throat> this lady would be much better off knitting something more suitable. I mean, something, something warm for a sweet old lady, like a sweet old man. <laughs> That's why my mother sent me three socks because she'd heard I'd grown another foot. <laughs> she try knitting Dennis Healy and you set her eyebrows. They, you know, see, the trouble is she must have uh, done this sock knitting thing during the war. Yes. She probably studied under General Patton. Yes. General Patton. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, let me just say, this is vintage Dodge. <laughs> Uh, not, really not, I don't think anybody, well. anybody in the audience even remembers General Patton. <laughs> I think she should take all these socks and send them to the House of Commons during question time, because we're always telling them to put a sock in it. And, uh, that'd be the best place for I it. think she should, uh, be, uh, a relative should get hold of her, and uh, they should uh, wean her onto uh, some more hobbies. Give us, give us some more interest, like I, indoor like hang gliding, uh, for instance. Right. Well, well, don't you think... Uh, Ken and Bernie, that we're being unfair here, Mr. Frost. Now, here's a lady who enjoys doing something. Why, why, would you, why would you stop somebody doing something because they enjoy doing it? It's like the old lady that lived next door to me. If I didn't go in and bury her daily meal every morning, she'd hate it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that I'm trying to save 20 pence buying a daily mail or a mirror. Uh, the only thing I hate is she's done the crossword. <laughs> I went in a paper shop but last week. And I was stuck yesterday in the crossword. Oh, I see. What was the, what was the clue? Heavily laden postman. I said, how many letters? She said, thousands of them. <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, my parents used to have a paper shop, but it blew away. And um, <laughs> I, was in a, I was in a paper shop yesterday and I said, the Daily Mail, please. And uh, he said, oh, they're going up tomorrow. I said, I'll take 12 then. <laughs> I well, what are we going to do about this little old lady? Well, there's a lot more things she could do with her what, life, what, isn't there? What, what could she do? Well, she could start take pets, because old ladies, they love pets. No, she could start breeding. That's she could, right. Uh, I mean, I know a woman of 80 Elephants. that started breeding. She, she crossed an Alsatian <coughs> with a giraffe, and she's got a dog that barks at aeroplanes. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, this lady, this is... I knew a fella this lady's from Yorkshire. Yeah, she, I knew a fella crossed a bear with a kangaroo and got a fur coat with deep pockets. <laughs> The fellow who crossed, he crossed a potato with a sponge. I said, what does it taste like? He said, bloody awful, but it holds a stack of gravy. <laughs> At least thick woolly socks could be used for insulating other parts of the body. Ah, uh, ah. They could be, you could cut the, uh, oh, cut the toes it. out and you could use them as leg warmers. Yes. Uh, yes. You, you, you could cut the balaclava, mittens, mittens, mittens. The mine, I mean, yes, the, the, we can probably, we'll probably get a lot of suggestions see, now, about see, what these socks can be turned into. Mr. Dodd, just give sound advice, Mr. Brown, you think, use these socks for something else. I mean, you could, you could go to the bank and collect ten pence pieces and a, give me a sock full of that. 
And you see, you can put the ten pence piece in it, keep the sock in your handbag, and if anybody comes along to mug you or molest you, woof, with a sock. Yeah. Isn't that right? Yeah. Right. So that's the that's advice. Marvelous, that. anybody, or, anybody who wanted to mug you for money would have to be out of their mind. Or if next door's, even three o'clock oh. in the morning, if next door's Tomcat was creating a howl, you could throw the sock at it and be, that would be a sock in the bus. <laughs> So the advice is clear. Mrs. Parker, recycle the socks. Exactly. That's yeah. it. Recycle yeah, that's the socks. Yeah, put them over the handlebars. That's what we should have said. Then your advice you're going to throw them up and down the street. <laughs> and so Frank now Martin. we come back to our tall tales, friends. Tall tales. To the tall tales, we need your solution of how this happened. This is uh, late last September. Mark Morris obtained what appeared to be the perfect job. He was paid sixty pounds a day for lying on a bed. <laughs> but he had to put up with people staring at him. Now, what sort of a job <coughs> could that have been? Morris. Mark Morris. He probably worked for British Leyland. Morris. Mm. Could have done, didn't he? Mark Morris. He was probably on a youth opportunity scheme. Mm. They do that now. Have these young fellows. They got the sort of job. They give youth opportunities. Uh, each uh, young person is given a uh, copy of the Karma Sutra so that they'll all end up with a good position. <laughs> I should think he, he, he was, uh, he was uh, Mark with a name like Morris. I think he was uh, probably auditioning for the night shift at British Leyland. I read in the paper the other week that a fellow at British Leyland lost two fingers in an accident and he didn't realise it until he was saying goodnight to the foreman. Did you see that? <laughs> I knew a fellow, I knew a fellow was so lazy, even in his sleep he used to hitchhike. I've always wanted a job to do with beds. My ambition once was to be, to be a knocker-up in a harem. Um, <laughs> Well, they do. They have so many to a bed there. They have about 50, 60 people in the one bed. And if you have to get up in the middle of the night to, well, you have to leave a bookmark. <laughs> I think uh, this, I think he's a, he's a lucky lad because he's got a job that he can rest on. I mean, there's so many different unusual jobs you can get, isn't it? I mean, like a bloke I know, he was, he was a ringer out for a one-arm window cleaner. One yeah. The <laughs> but I, I knew a fellow who hasn't worked for years. He's a coronation flag seller. <laughs> <laughs> or a long distance lorry driving the Isle of Wight. <laughs> he got the sack because he kept losing the way. <laughs> but then there's something else. You see, here's the thing which I think we're all missing. And all of these things that Mr. Frost has given us, there's one, always one word that stands out. People staring at him. Stare. See, Why yeah. are they staring? He was advertising this uh, particular mattress, and he was, they had a big advert. Uh, you know, we stand behind every bed we sell. Mm. Nearly. Not quite, but nearly. No, he no. was paid sixty pounds a day yeah. to lie on a bed in the window of a Kensington bookshop. Good God. And the window was advertising a book on the poet Chatterton and featured a tableau of the painting Chatterton on his deathbed. Musician George White lives with his wife at the top of a tower block in South East London and is glad of the lift to bring him down all 20 floors. Coming home late at night, however, George always gets out at the 14th floor and arrives home exhausted. Why does he do this? He was scared that if his wife heard him coming up in the lift, she'd ask him to go down and put the cat out. <laughs> well, that was, uh, I think it's something to do with six floors here, hasn't it? He couldn't walk up six floors. Uh -huh, I've got it. The other day, somebody I've gave me it. a... The other day, no, he's got it. Wait a minute, he's got it. He's got yeah, it. He I'm may lose tell it. it. <laughs> no. He'll tell it. No, go on. No, I've got it. I well, I've, I've got, got it. it. I, I think... Because I had an uncle that lived in a tower block, and uh, he lived on the 24th floor, and it only cost him £10 a week rent, but it cost him £4,000 for the stair carpet. <laughs> somebody, somebody gave me a lift the other day on the M6, but I had to leave it there because it was too heavy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I... I I think either. I was on, I was on the uh, M1 the other day and, and I ran out of petrol. And I must say, one of the lovely things about being a known character is there are so many kind people in the world. Mm -hmm. And this Irish fella came up and he saw my Irish registration number and he said, Excuse me, are you Frank Carson? I said, Yes, it was wrong, Mr. Carson. I said, I have run out of petrol. He said, Great, right. Well, I'll give you a hand. I said, That's very terrible. He said, Right, follow me, I've got a full tank. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
I was in a lift the other day and this Irishman got in. <laughs> <laughs> I said next. to him, what floor? He said, I think it's plywood. <laughs> Bernie, do you have any thoughts on what could be the explanation it's of one George? Of two uh, he's, a, he's a musician, yes. and, and um, he, he, he's, he's a name called White. I think that, um, I believe the true answer to this, and is, is that what you want, the true answer? I think the reason that he gets out at the 14th floor is that he can't reach the 20th floor button because he's only four foot tall. Correct! Thank you. I happen to know that Rolf Harris Man. once caught his didgeridoo in lifting <laughs> in the lift doors, and that's why he took a painting. <laughs> well, there you have it. If you're wondering why your neighbour wears a bucket on his head or why there's steam coming from your telephone, let us know and we'll try and work it out with the aid of our geniuses. For now, this is David Frost thanking you all for joining us. On behalf of Ken Dodd, Bernie Clifton, Frank Carson, Andrew Palmer and Nell Brennan, who devised and researched, and our producer, Edward Taylor. And we hope you'll join us again next time. It's time to pull the other one.